hello students hope all of you are doing good as in this lockdown period we are not able to come to the class so let's just start online so in this second year the first zoology chapter is human reproduction so in this human reproduction chapter we have completely separate male female reproductive system then after that we have to study the process of fertilization implantation embryonic development pregnancy parturition and lactation so before coming to the chapter let's just see some introduction points what are they first of all in case of human we are coming to the class mammalia so in this mammalia group what we have we have completely separate male and female reproductive system in different organism that means we have separate male and female organism so that condition when the organisms they have completely separate male and female reproductive system in different groups in different organisms they are known as the dioecious organism so in case of human we are dioecious organism so in this introduction point we should know that in case of human we are coming to dioecious group second thing in case of human what type of animal we are oviparous or viviparous oviparous and viviparous means those organism which lay eggs they are known as oviparous organism and when that organism they are directly deliver the new uh, young ones or baby they are known as viviparous organism so in case of human what type of animal we are we are viviparous animal so so second point in this introduction we are viviparous third point we should know that what type of fertilization we have fertilization means the meeting of male and female gametes so in case of human meet, meeting of male and female gametes occur inside the female reproductive system so that type of fertilization where the meeting of male and female gametes occur inside the body of the female organism that is known as internal fertilization and those organism which have meeting of male and female gametes outside the body that may be in the water or any other medium that is known as external fertilization so in case of human we are going to have internal fertilization next point that in case of human what type of development we have development means that in the development process do that organism have any larval stage in case of human the young ones the babies the new young ones they are exactly like the parents so those organism which actually deliver the baby which are completely look like their parents that is going to have one development that is known as direct development but as you see in case of frogs in case of amphibians what they have they deliver the baby but those babies they actually do not look like their adult one or their parents that type of development that is known as indirect development indirect development uh, development means that this organism have a intermediate stage that intermediate stage is a larva so in case of human we don't have any larval stage so that's why we have direct development so these are the introductory points you have to know about human so we have dioecious condition dioecious condition means we have separate male and female organism that are present in different different organism the male and the female reproductive organs are present in separate individuals second one we are viviparous viviparous means those organism which uh, are going to be a type of animal which are directly giving birth the baby not the eggs so the third point is in case of human we have internal fertilization internal fertilization means this internal fertilization means where the meeting of male and female gametes occur inside the body that is known as internal fertilization 
And the last point that we have direct development. Direct development means those organisms which are going to have directly the uh, same type of organism which looks similar and they're looking exactly like their parents. So that type of development is known as direct development. So now let us start with the male reproductive system. So in this male reproductive system, first of all, we should know what is male uh, reproductive organs. First of all, in case of male, we have primary and secondary sex organs. In case of female also, we are going to have primary sex organ and secondary sex organ. What is primary sex organ? That organ, they are producing the gamete that is known as the primary sex organ. And secondary sex organs are those organs which help or assist the primary sex organ in their development, maturation or transfer. So in case of male reproductive system, the primary sex organ is a pair of testes and secondary sex organs are those organs which are helping the testes. What are they? We have different ducts, we have different glands. These are known as the secondary sex organ. So let's just start first of all with the primary sex organ that is testis. So in case of testis, first of all we should know what is the length and width of the testis and what is the location. First of all, in case of testis, the length is around 4 to 5 cm and width of around 2 to 3 cm. The location of the testis, that is extra abdominal, extra abdominal means the testis, both the testis are present outside the body and that is covered by a flap or the membrane that is known as scrotum. So the location of the testis that is extra abdominal. Now the development of the testis, the development of the testis occurs inside the abdomen but after that they become extra abdominal. What is the reason why they become extra abdominal? Actually what happens whenever the human male is inside the mother's womb at that time the testis development occurs inside the abdomen that is covered by the membrane that is called as peritoneum. But later on during the seventh uh, month of period of gestation at that time whenever the testis completely developed then after that it starts to descend from the abdomen and after that it become extra abdominal so that's why you can see suppose this is the testis and whenever it was developed inside the abdomen that one also covered by this peritoneum and whenever it descends whenever it is descending then does it pierce this peritoneum no whenever it is descending then also this peritone peritoneum along with the testis also descends and that structure that peritoneum membrane that is known as mesorchium so the location of the testis is extra abdominal now both the two testis they are present inside a sac that sac is actually uh, known and this is called as scrotum or scrotal sac. A pair of testes they are found present within a sac that is known as scrotum. So what is the function of scrotum? Scrotum is actually a sac like structure which is divided into two parts which store which actually hold both the two testes separately. So what is the main function of the scrotum? The scrotum actually provides the testis to maintain a temperature 2 to 2.5 degree less than that of the body temperature. Now why this temperature is needed? The 
formation of the of, uh, that gametes, the spermatozoa, they require actually the temperature of 2 to 2.5 degree less than normal internal body temperature. And that will be not possible if the testes, they are present inside the body. So that's why they are present, they become actually extra abdominal. And that's why the scrotum holds the testes they are present along attaching to the body but they are present outside they actually maintain maximum distance from the body so that is known as the scrotum the main function of the scrotum is to provide the temperature which is necessary for the process of gametogenesis and in case of male we will call this as the process of spermatogenesis now the next important thing we have to see that the structure of the testis from outside. This testis that is present already I told you that is present inside the scrotal sac or the scrotum. Now in between the scrotum and the testis we are going to have three membranes. What are those membranes? The outside membrane, the outermost membrane this membrane this is known as tunica vaginalis so this tunica vaginalis is present outside the middle layer which is present just behind the tunica vaginalis that is known as tunica albuginia so this middle membrane this is known as tunica albuginia so this is present in between the tunica vaginalis and the innermost membrane the name of the innermost lining this is known as tunica vasculosa vasculosa means this is highly vascularized vascularized means this is provided with finest blood vessel so there are three membranes we have outermost tunica vaginalis middle tunica albuginia and the innermost tunica vasculosa now the testis here here you can see the testis so this test is attached to the abdominal cavity by a cord this is the cord and here also we have another cord both these two cords they will hold the testes in their exact location so what is this above we have the spermatic cord and posteriorly we have another structure that is known as gubernaculum So these two structures are very much important. We have spermatic cord which is present uh, above which is actually taking, uh, uh, taking this structure testis above to the body cavity and inside that is posteriorly we are also going to have another cord that is known as gubernacula. Now both the, test, both the two testes whenever it become extra abdominal they actually pass through this pelvic cavity. Now see the pelvic girdle suppose this is the pelvic girdle this pelvic girdle have three parts ilium, ischium and pubis as we already know in the earlier movement and locomotion you got that this pelvic girdle is made up of three bones they are known as ilium, ischium and pubis and whenever suppose this is the ilium bone ischium and the pubis now in between this two ilium and the pubis we are going to have a canal this is canal and we have a ligament this is known as inguinal ligament and because of this ligament here you can see we are going to have develop a canal and that canal is known as inguinal canal and both the two testes actually descends whenever it is descending from the abdomen it actually pass through this inguinal canal now the thing is this spermatic cord actually this actually pass through this inguinal canal and attach to the body abdomen that is known as spermatic cord sometimes this is happening also that may be possible that 
the whenever the baby develops the testis and intra-abdominally it is possible but whenever at the time of seven month they have to descend down it is not able to descend because of any problem in the guindal canal or any other reason the testis cannot become extra-abdominal and then the testis remain inside the body and that makes the individual male infertile or sterile so that condition whenever the testis is hidden inside hidden means it is present but it is present remain inside the abdomen and it is not becoming uh, extra abdominal that condition this is known as cryptorchidism so a very important term we have to know about cryptorchidism that this is a condition when the testis cannot become extra abdominal it cannot pass through this inguinal canal and become extra abdominal that condition is known as cryptorchidism now the testis here we have the structure above we are going to have the spermatic cord that actually pass through this inguinal canal and attach to the body that is abdomen now another important two muscles we have that are known as dartos muscle and cremaster muscle the cremaster muscle runs parallelly to the spermatic cord so this is the cremaster muscle and we have another muscle that is circular that is present around the testis that is known as the dartos muscle now what is the reason of this two muscle this two muscle actually maintains the normal temperature for the process of spermatogenesis now the thing is whenever the temperature of the body decrease or fall down at that time this cremester muscle and dartos muscle will shrink will contract and that actually come towards the body cavity body so that we can able to uh, detain some temperature to the testis also for the ideal temperature for the spermatogenesis and whenever the body temperature rises maybe in the summer season at that time this cremester and the dartos muscle will relax and it maintains the maximum distance from the body so that the temperature can decrease so we are going to have two important muscle here also one which is run exactly parallel to the spermatic cord that is known as cremester muscle which run parallelly to the spermatic cord and another muscle which is circular that is around the testis that is known as dartos muscle so these two muscles are very much important for maintenance of the ideal temperature for the process of spermatogenesis. Now let us start with the internal structure of the testis. See here we have the testis. Internally the testis, both the two testis have 250 compartments. Each compartment is known as testicular lobule. So this way we are going to have 250 compartments and those compartments are known as testicular lobule. So this is a 3D structure from all the sides we are going to have the testicular lobule. Now inside the testicular lobule we are going to have one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubule. So seminiferous tubules are present inside the testicular lobule. It may be one, it may be two also, but it may be three also. Maximum three seminiferous tubule we are going to have. So this one is the seminiferous tubule. Inside the seminiferous tubule, we will see the different cells, two types of cells we are going to have, which will later on in the spermatogenesis be required. But here we'll see that after this seminiferous tubule, what are the things present, what are the ducts present. 
So after this seminiferous tubule, we are going to have the next duct. So this duct will not going to stop anywhere. It will continue and also it comes outside the testis and later on it will form the epididymis, vas deferens, urethra, etc. So this seminiferous tubule will extend and whenever it is extending, two or three of them, they will get blend and after that it form only one. So this is known as tubuli recti. So this structure, this is known as tubuli recti. So this tubular recti, they will go on extending, blend two or three of them and after that it form the next structure. This is known as retitestis. So this way after that we are going to have the retitestis. So this retitestis go on extending and after that we are going to have the next structure. This is known as vasa efferentia. So this is called as vasa efferentia. So just see this is the structure. First of all the testes, they contain 250 compartments. They are known as testicular lobule. In each testicular lobule, we are going to have 1 to 3. 1 to 3 highly coiled seminiferous tubule. That means one testicular lobule will going to have 1 to 3 seminiferous tubule. Now, this seminiferous tubule will extend and it will form the tubuli recti. Two or three of them, they will blend and after that it form the retitestis and after that go on blending and after that it form the last structure that is known as vasa efferentia. So this ducts, they are known as the intratesticular duct system. So intratesticular duct system means those ducts which is present inside the testis, what we can call them, they are known as intratesticular duct system that can come this exactly this way also. In abbreviation, it can be called as ITDS. So what are they? First of all, we are going to have seminiferous tubule. After the seminiferous tubule, what we are going to have? Tubuli recti. This tubular recti will extend to form retitestis. And after that, we have the last that is vasa efferentia. So, see, suppose in each testicular lobule, we are going to have two, only two seminiferous tubules. So, in one testis, how many seminiferous tubules we are going to have? 500. So at last, this 500 seminiferous tubule will blend, then the tubular recti numbers will decrease. This way they will go on decreasing its number, that means two or three of them will blend and after that it will go on blending and at last, whenever it comes to vasa efferentia, we are going to have only 15 to 20 vasa efferentia. So just see, from 500, it is decreasing to 15 to 20. That means two or three of them will have to blend. And after that, they will blend, go on forming the different ducts. So now, let us start with the outer external structure of the testis also. Already we have seen that the testis, we have 250 compartments. What are those known as? These are known as testicular lobule. In each testicular lobule, we are going to have one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubule. Those seminiferous tubule will extend. They will form this tubuli recti. This blue part is tubuli recti. Tubuli recti will extend to form the retitestis. This is black part, retitestis. And after that, we are going to have the last part. So you can see posteriorly, those ducts which will ascend posteriorly upward, that green colored duct that is known as the vasa differentia. So that constitute the intratesticular duct system. After that, this intratesticular duct system carry the spermatozoa outside the testis. What is that known as? Whenever this testis they remove that means the ducts will ascending upside and remove outside what is that known as this structure this is known as epididymis so what is epididymis whenever this vasa efferentia come outside the testis that is known as vasa uh, epididymis so this epididymis is going to have two important function what are those functions? First function is to temporarily store the 
spermatozoa or the matured sperm. So this vasa efferentia come outside that is known as the epididymis. This epididymis will have three parts. What are they? The first part, this is known as caput. After that, we will have the next part that is known as corpus. And the last part, this is known as coda. So this test is whenever the vasa efferentia come outside, that structure is known as epididymis. So this epididymis, the structure is epididymis. So this epididymis will have three parts, caput, corpus and coda. So first of all, there may be one question. That question is, this vasa efferentia, whenever it out, comes outside the testis, what is the first part of epididymis called as? This is known as caput. And after that, whenever this epididymis will form the next structure, what will be the last part? That will be coda. So I told that they have two functions. So first of all, epididymis, they store the spermatozoa temporarily. And after that, it is also going to have a very important function. What is that? This is decapacitation. So what is decapacitation? Decapacitation. decapacitation means here inside the testis whenever the spermatozoa are formed it starts to function so what happened the so function of the uh, spermatozoa we'll see later on but before that we have to know that inside this seminiferous tubule the process of spermatogenesis starts and whenever it forms the uh, spermatozoa it starts to function inside the male reproductive system itself which is not possible which should not occur it should function only inside the female reproductive system so that's why what happened whenever the testis is uh, forming the spermatozoa it should be matured but it should not function so that's why whenever the spermatozoa is coming towards the region of the epididymis temporarily the function of the spermatozoa is restricted or the function or capacity of the spermatozoa is deactivated so that reaction this is known as decapacitation reaction so in very short i will tell you what actually this decapacitation reaction is first of all this is the testis so this is the test uh, spermatozoa suppose so this spermatozoa here this is the body part this is neck part tail part and here we have a very important structure the apical part of the spermatozoa that is known as acrosome so this acrosome actually release three different type of enzymes so those enzymes should not release inside the testis itself it should work whenever it will reach to the female reproductive system so that's why what happened whenever this testis formed the spermatozoa whenever it is going to the region of epididymis the function of this acrosome is deactivated or restricted so that's why what happens this epididymis will actually cover this acrosome by a uh, glycoprotein layer and here we will see this glycoprotein layer so this glycoprotein layer will be given by this epididymis and that reaction is known as decapacitation reaction so that the spermatozoa will not work inside the male reproductive system. Whenever it will go to the female reproductive system, once, in, uh, once again capacitation reaction will occur whenever this glycoprotein layer will be shed and after that in the female reproductive system it will start working. So that reaction in the female reproductive system will be known as capacitation reaction but for now in this epididymis the uh, spermatozoa will restrict, will deactivate its function, we will call it as decapacitation reaction. Now, let us see just after the epididymis, what happens 
to this structure this epididymis that will start to ascend upside upside this inguinal canal it will pass through this inguinal canal and it will make a turn around the urinary bladder so you just see first of all here this is the epididymis this epididymis will ascend upside so here whenever it is ascending upside here you can see in this region maybe it is passing through this inguinal canal upside the body so whenever it is ascending upside it will take a turn around the urinary bladder you can see this is a turn around the urinary bladder and here it formed a urethra so this structure here you can see this is the urinary bladder and urinary bladder will also open its secretion that is urine to the same duct. So you can see first of all whenever this epiditime is ascend upside what we can call this structure this structure just after the epiditime is will have the next structure this is known as vas deferens. So this is called as vas deferens. And whenever this vas deferens will take a turn around the urinary bladder, this structure is the common passage for both the urine and the gamete. This is known as urinogenital duct. See here we have a difference that in case of male, this is the urethra which is the common passage for both the urine and the gamete. But it is not for the female. In case of female, this is known only as the urinary duct. Why? Because in case of female, this is the passage for only urine, not for the gamete. But in case of male, this is the urethra or this is also called as urinogenital duct, which is the common passage for both urine and the gamete. Now just see here, whenever this urinary bladder opens a secretion, that is the urine, here in this region we have a very important three accessory glands. What are those accessory glands? The first gland, which is a paired gland, what we can call it, this is known as seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle they release actually this is a paired gland and it is also the largest accessory gland which release a liquid a fluid and that fluid will actually give a medium where the spermatozoa can survive so this is the seminal vesicle just after that in this region just behind the urinary bladder we are going to have the next gland which is a single only single only one gland we have that is known as prostate gland and actually it is a combination of 15 to 20 very small small glands and after that here in this region we are going to have the last gland which is also paired but it is the smallest one so here we are going to have the last gland what is that this is known as bulbo urethral gland or cowper's gland so you just see first of all this gland the largest one here actually this is the this is not large this is small so here what is this this is known as seminal vesicle second gland which is single but it is a combination of 15 to 20 small small gland this is known as prostate gland and the last one this is known as cowper's gland or bulbo urethral gland this is known as bulbo urethral gland now to see very important thing is in case of this three glands they are known as male accessory glands they are releasing a liquid this liquid collectively is known as semen this is known as semen very much important thing is what that semen constitute the liquid that is released from all these three glands collectively we will call this as semen now from this liquid we have 60 percent volume that is released by seminal vesicle and around 20 to 25 percentage of this semen that will be released from the prostate gland and the last one that is around one second uh, 10 20 around that much percentage that will be released from this bulboyurethral gland now this seminal vesicle that 60 percent volume 
what that contains see this seminal vesicle whenever it is releasing this secretion that secretion will contain the most important energy source that is fructose fructose that will provide the source of energy whenever the spermatozoa will reach to the female reproductive system at that time the male gamete they will get acquire the uh, nutrition uh, acquire the energy from the fructose second one it will also contain some ions it will also contain some enzymes it will also contain some hormones so here it will release another uh, thing along with this fructose that is prostaglandin then after that it will also contain some ions also it will release some other hormones some enzymes also so what is that uh, function of prostaglandin see this prostaglandin that will actually a hormone so this hormone will actually act as a urine uterine contraction so what happens whenever along with that semen that prostaglandin enters inside the female reproductive system then what happened inside the uh, female reproductive system that means inside the uterus we have this prostaglandin receptor see a very important thing that prostaglandin is released from the seminal vesicle but prostaglandin receptor is found inside the female reproductive system so what happened whenever this prostaglandin enters inside the female reproductive system at that time what happened it binds to the receptor form a hormone receptor complex and after that it will develop a suction pool and whenever it develops a suction pool the spermatozoa can also ascend along with that suction pool inside the female reproductive system so that it can reach to the site of fallopian tube and also it can help in the fertilization so that's why it released this thing so first of all see here it is going to have fructose it is also going to have prostaglandin it will have some ions or uh, as well as enzymes the ions will be calcium ion so the seminal vesicle that liquid is basic in nature see a very important thing that 60% volume is basic in nature second one the gland is prostate this is the single gland it is actually the combination of 15 to 20 small small glands their secretion is acidic so it release a uh, acidic secretion so what happened this acidic secretion that around 20 to 25 percent so after that this bulbo urethral gland that will also release some amount some volume of the semen that will actually help basically in neutralization of the urine so just see here what happened whenever this urethra you just see this urethra become literally this is horizontal in nature so due to previous urination some amount of urine can be present in in this region so in this horizontal region of the urethra so in the region So in the horizontal region of the urethra, maybe it is possible due to previous urination, some amount of urine can be still present inside this urethra. So that's why to neutralize that uh, urine, the acidity of the urine, that bulbo urethral gland releases a secretion and that is also basic. So as you can see, the prostate uh, gland, the bulbo urethral gland and the seminal vesicle together constitute that cement and that, that semen and that semen that actually is ultimately basic in pH. So what happened here the seminal vesicle uh, prostate as well as this bulbo urethral gland they produce that semen where we are going to have around 200 to 300 millions of spermatozoa
So here you can see that cement that constitute that 200 uh, to 300 millions of spermatozoa, which is normal. If that spermatozoa count is less than 20 million, then we have a condition that is known as oligojuspermia. And in that condition, may be it is possible that the fertility of the individual may can decrease. So that condition, if suppose that semen contains less than 200, that means around 20 or less than that of the 20 millions of spermatozoa, then it is possible that that condition is infertile. So this condition is known as oligojuspermia. So what happens? If that semen do not contain any spermatozoa, then what we can call it, that condition is known as aegospermia. So in that condition, the male will be completely sterile. So as we can see, that semen that is released from this three glands, we will see in detail that what are the three different uh, accessory glands and their secretion. So, let us see once again in detail the different male accessory glands. First of all, seminal vesicle. That seminal vesicle will produce around 60% volume of the semen. Then prostate gland, it will release around 20 to 25% volume of the semen and remaining that will be released from this bulbourethral gland. Next one, in case of seminal vesicle, it contains basically a hormone that is prostaglandin. As I already I have mentioned, what is the function of prostaglandin? It will be released from both the seminal vesicle as well as prost uh, prostate gland. So prostaglandin will be released also from this prostate gland. Third important point that the seminal vesicle, it will release some very important clotting factors like fibrinogen. So this clotting factor help in coagulation or clotting of the semen outside the body. And along with that, it will also contain a number of uh, ions like calcium ion. Now we can see in case of prostate gland, this prostate gland will also constitute here an acid that is citric acid. And because of this citric acid, actually this prostate gland secretion is acidic in nature. And the last one, this bulboerectral gland, the secretion of the bulboerectral gland basically neutralizes the acidity of the urine. So you can see the secretion of seminal vesicle, it is basically basic in nature. The secretion of prostate gland, it is acidic in nature. And the last one, that is the secretion of bulboerectral gland, once again, it is basic in nature. Now, let us see the internal structure of the testes. As already we have seen that the testis internally it is going to have 250 compartments that is known as testicular lobule. Now we will see inside the testicular lobule we have those seminiferous tubule. What is the structure of that? Internally the seminiferous tubule will contain two types of cells. One that is maximally it is present that is germinal epithelium and along with that very little but still inside the seminiferous tubule we have also another type of cell that is known as Sertoli cell. So let us see a structure of one testicular lobule. If you see this is one testicular lobule only then it is going to have one to three highly coiled seminiferous tubule. So you can see here these are the seminiferous tubule. Now 
Inside the seminiferous tubule, what we have? Two types of cell. Maximally, 90% it is going to be the germinal epithelium. So here we are going to have the germinal epithelial cells. And along with that germinal epithelial cells, we are also going to have another type of cell that is known as Sertoli cell. So here also we are going to have another type of cell. It's very long. It's known as Sertoli cell. Now to see here outside the seminiferous tubule what we are going to have. We have some cluster of cells. Those cluster of cells what we can call them. These cells are known as the Leydig cells or interstitial cells. They are very much important as already we know that the testes perform as an endocrine gland also as it is releasing the hormone. So what is the hormone releasing cell? Here we have this Leydig cell. This Leydig cell will release that hormone uh, that is known as testosterone. So you can see now we have this internal structure. Now we'll just label it let's just see first of all what those cluster of cells known as these are known as interstitial cell or leydig cell now inside the seminiferous tubule so that red colored lobule like structure that is known as seminiferous tubule inside the seminiferous tubule we are going to have two types of cell this one which is very much less in number that is known as ser Toli cell and maximally we are going to have those germinal epithelium which is going to be the cells to produce those gametes or spermatozoa. So here this one this is known as germinal epithelium. So this germinal epithelial cells they are cuboidal in nature. So these are the germinal epithelial cells. Now to see one very important thing about the Sertoli cell. What is the function of the Sertoli cell? See here, if the germinal epithelial cell produce those gametes, those gametes will take nourishment from the Sertoli cell. So those Sertoli cell will provide the nutrients to the growing spermatozoa and those spermatozoa, the products, the excretory nitrogenous waste product or metabolic waste product, they release from those cells, the spermatozoa. So those waste product will also be absorbed by the Sertoli cell. The Sertoli cell will also release two very important things. One is a uh, protein that is known as ABP that is androgen binding protein. Androgen binding protein that help in concentration of the hormone testosterone inside the seminiferous tubule. So this Leydig cells that will release those uh, uh, protein that is APP androgen binding protein that help in concentration of this uh, secretion that is the testosterone hormone inside the seminiferous tubule. So this Sertoli cell, see this Sertoli cell it will help in nourishing it will help in nourishing the spermatozoa so it helps in nourishment second thing it will absorb the waste the waste product released from the spermatozoa third thing it will release a protein that is known as androgen binding protein so this androgen binding protein that will actually concentrate the hormone that is released from Leydig cell so this Leydig cell was releasing the hormone androgens this is a family so one of a hormone is testosterone so that testosterone will be concentrated inside the seminiferous tubule by this ABP third fourth thing this Sertoli cell will also release a factor that is known as AMF anti-mullerian factor so whenever the baby is inside the mother's womb at that time the mullerian duct will start to develop in both male and female organism so that mullerian duct that later on will form the um, uh, that will form the female genetic uh, female duct so fallopian tube is the duct so that fallopian tube development will not be it will be inhibited it will be stopped or restricted by anti-mullerian factor and also this Sertoli cell will release another hormone that is known as inhibin so this inhibin will actually help in giving a negative feedback to the pituitary gland 
to stop the release of FSH hormone. So regulation of this uh, hormonal balance or maintenance we will see in the next uh, part so here these are the function of the sertoli cell uh, what is the function of germinal epithelium it will form the gametes and last one the latex cell it will release the hormone that hormone is that hormone is so that hormone is testosterone Now, let us see the process of spermatogenesis. So, the process of spermatogenesis occur inside the seminiferous tubule. As we can see, the seminiferous tubule diagram already we have drawn. Now, we have to cut a just seminiferous tubule and we will remove that coil part and we will just uncoil it. And whenever we uncoil it, then we will see the types of cell inside the seminiferous tubule. Already I have told you that inside the seminiferous tubule we have two types of cell. First cell, this black colored cells, these are the germinal epithelium which is cuboidal in nature. Simple cuboidal epithelial cell. And along with that, this seminiferous tubule will also contain another cell that is known as Sertoli cell. So what was the function of the Sertoli cell? It helped in nourishment. It absorb the waste product it release ABP it release also inhibiting NAMF so you just see first of all the process of spermatogenesis how it occur under the influence of G, uh, GnRH so gonadotropin releasing hormone it is released from the hypothalamus as already we know that this pituitary gland that has to be stimulated by another gland that is hypothalamus so hypothalamus will release a hormone that is GnRH that is gonadotropin releasing hormone and under the influence of this GnRH gonadotropin releasing hormone the anterior pituitary gland it release a hormone that is FSH so full form of FSH already you know that is follicular stimulating hormone. So whenever follicular stimulating hormone FSH is released it makes in the blood and it will come to the region of process of spermatogenesis. So it is coming towards the region of testis. So what happened this germinal epithelium will be stimulated and some of the cells it will start to descend from this uh, some lining of the seminiferous tubule. So what we can call them these cells these cells are known as the spermatogonial cell. So we know that we are diploid organism. Diploid organism means our cells that contain twice n two sets of chromosomes. So we have in case of human we have twice n chromosome that is 46. Now, this spermatogonial cell will undergo differentiation process and whenever it undergo the differentiation process, another type of cell will be produced that is known as the primary spermatocyte. So, it is just a process that is simply differentiation. So, here no difference in the chromosome number that will be remain as it is like the spermatogonia have twice the number of chromosome that is 46 it will remain 46 in the primary spermatocyte also so this process is just the differentiation process then after that we'll see that this primary spermatocyte will undergo the process of first meiosis so here this is the first meiosis and whenever first meiosis completes it form two types uh, two cells actually from one primary spermatocyte we are going to have we are going to produce two cells so each of them they will contain only n only n chromosome that means here it is going to have 23 chromosome so spermatogonia primary spermatocyte they're going to have twice n chromosome that means 46 chromosome two sets of chromosome it is going to have but whenever it undergo the first meiosis the reduction division occurs and after that it is going to produce n number of chromosome only that means here after this first meiosis it is going to produce secondary spermatocyte 
so whenever secondary spermatocyte is produced it is going to have n number of chromosome after that this secondary spermatocyte will complete the process that means it completes the meiosis so second meiosis will be completed and we are going to have the next cell what is the next cell this cell is called as the spermatid so here what happens it is not one second reduction division it is just the equational division so here also the, though it is second meiosis see this is the second meiosis and after second meiosis it is going to produce the spermatids so that spermatid also have the n number of chromosome and after that whenever the spermatids are produced after that we are going to have the last differentiation process that means after that the cell number will not increase it is going to have just a differentiation process differentiation means it is going to develop its head its neck its tail that means whole metabolism all these different organelles will be rearranged and that cell will be the last matured developed spermatozoa or the matured sperm where it is going to develop this acrosome i told you about the acrosome next one its body neck tail everything will be produced and it is the last cell this is known as the spermatozoa so that spermatozoa will also contain n number of chromosome it is just the normal differentiation process so whenever this process is completed we will see the whole process of spermatogenesis so this whole process is the process of spermatogenesis and whenever spermatids form the spermatozoa that process is known as spermiogenesis remember that two point spermiogenesis and spermatogenesis spermatogenesis is the production of the spermatozoa from the spermatogonia and spermiogenesis is the formation of spermatozoa from the spermatids okay so here we are going to have the whole process of spermatogenesis in the process of spermatogenesis you see you have only one spermatogonial cell that undergo differentiation produce the primary spermatocyte now this primary spermatocyte will undergo the first meiosis uh, first meiosis process and produce the two cell that is known as the secondary spermatocyte this secondary spermatocyte will complete the process of meiosis that means it complete the second meiosis and it produce the second uh, spermatids and after that this spermatids will just mature that means differentiation process will occur and after that we will have the spermatozoa so as we can see the number of cells that means if you have only one spermatogonia uh, then we are going to have four spermatozoa if you have suppose 200 primary spermatocyte how many numbers of spermatids is going to form suppose we have 200 secondary spermatocyte how many spermatozoa will be formed that type of question will come so that's why you have to remember this chart this is very very much important for the neat also as well as for your boards now let's just move to the last part of the uh, whole male reproductive system that is hormonal control of spermatogenesis see what happens the spermatogenesis process will not occur alone without the help of the pituitary gland and even the pituitary gland is under the control of hypothalamus so we will see from the hypothalamus so hypothalamus it release a hormone you can see the hormones released from the pituitary gland fsh and lh both these two hormones we will call this are as the gonadotropins and to stimulate the uh, anterior pituitary to release the fsh and lh this hypothalamus will release z and rh that means gonadotropin releasing hormone now gonadotropin releasing hormone will stimulate 
the pituitary gland that is anterior pituitary we already know that pituitary gland will have two part anterior and posterior so anterior pituitary gland will release seven hormones and posterior pituitary gland will release two hormones so anterior pituitary will release both these two hormones under the influence of ZNRH one is FSH and another is the LH so pituitary gland will release both these two hormones which will function separately see first of all FSH so this FSH will stimulate the seminiferous tubule inside the seminiferous tubule we are going to have the we are going to have this germinal epithelium so that germinal epithelium will start the function the process of spermatogenesis so this FSH will also stimulate the Sertoli cell so this Sertoli cell under the influence of the FSH it will release the hormone that is actually a protein that is androgen binding protein so androgen binding protein will be released from the Sertoli cell under the influence of FSH so what happens after that see anterior pituitary will release the LH hormone so this LH hormone will mix in the blood come to the region of the testis and after that this stimulate another cell that is known as Leydig cell now this Leydig cell will release the hormone that is androgen see you can see here Sertoli cell will release ABP androgen binding protein and this androgens will be released from this Leydig cells so these are the androgens one of our hormone is testosterone so what happens this Leydig cell will release this testosterone hormone and under the influence of this uh, ABP androgen binding protein the Leydig cell you already know where the Leydig cells were there it is present outside the seminiferous tubule so Leydig cell whenever it is releasing this hormone that is uh, androgen that will be concentrated inside the seminiferous tubule under the influence of ABP androgen binding protein so what happened this Sertoli cell this ABP will help in the process of spermatogenesis and instead this hormone testosterone also will help in the process of spermatogenesis so this is the regulation of hormone action we should know this is actually the positive feedback one stimulate than under another stimulate than under one this is positive feedback we have negative feedback also that means how this process of spermatogenesis will be stopped so here what happened the spermatogenesis is not for whole life so what happened the spermatogenesis one set of uh, spermatos are formed then within that period of time FSH will be not released for the whole period of time so for time being if that FSH has to be stopped who will give that negative feedback to the pituitary gland so that it can stop the process uh, release of FSH it will be once again Sertoli cell so that Sertoli cell will release that hormone AB uh, remember inhibit so this inhibin that will give the negative feedback to the anterior pituitary so that FSH release can be stopped. So this is actually a negative feedback. So it gives the negative feedback to the pituitary gland so that it will not release. It will instead uh, simulate the hypothalamus also not to release ZNRH. For that time being, whenever Sertoli cell release this inhibin, then hypothalamus stop the release of ZNRH. Thus, pituitary gland will not release FSH. Same thing will be for the Leydig cell also. So this Leydig cell or this is also called as interstitial cell. So this interstitial cell that will release the hormone testosterone. So this interstitial, uh, interstitial cell, this testosterone will be released, which will also give the negative feedback to the hypothalamus also, as well as anterior pituitary, so that the release of LH can be stopped. So here we can see this process, this is the positive feedback so first of all hypothalamus will release ZNRH positive feedback anterior pituitary will release FSH and LH this is positive feedback FSH stimulate the Sertoli cell then after that Sertoli cell will release uh, uh, ABP then ABP will stimulate the process of spermatogenesis this is positive feedback here also it will same thing positive feedback here also it will be positive feedback 
but whenever the spermatogenesis is going on at that time we do not require the hormone FSH and LH so whenever already inside the seminiferous tubule we have we are continuing the process of spermatogenesis at that time this uh, inhibin from the Sertoli cell as well as testosterone from the Leydig cell give negative feedback to the hypothalamus as well as the pituitary gland so that it can stop the release of FSH and LH. And whenever this process will be completed, suppose once again it is coming to the epididymis, the spermatozoa is coming to the epididymis, then once again the process will be started once again. At that time, Sertoli cell will stop releasing inhibition and along with that Leydig cell will also stop releasing androgen so within that period of time once again this hypothalamus will start the release of ZNRH pituitary gland will start continuing the release of FSH and LH so this way the process will go on continuing sometime it will be activated sometime it will be deactivated so this is the hormonal regulation of spermatogenesis the whole thing we have discussed in this class this is about the whole male reproductive system in the next video we'll see the female reproductive system thank you